Thanks for tuning in to Dream City Omaha, where we're all about helping each other discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. We hope this message impacts your life, and be sure to like and subscribe for more. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's good to see those of you that are here in person, those of you joining us online. Thank you for being with us. We've got folks from Colorado, Montana, Oklahoma, New Mexico. I think my mom is watching in New Mexico. Hi, mom. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, Norfolk, Nebraska. Is it Norfolk? Norfolk? Norf Norfolk? How do you how do you say it? Norfolk. Norfolk. Folk. Folk. I think it depends on if you're from there or not, right? Like, that's what I've heard. People that are there, like, nobody can say it right unless you're from that particular area. I'm not going to try and say it because I'll probably get it wrong. Those of you watching from there, today we welcome you. Thank you for being with us today. My name is, is Pastor John. If this is your first time, maybe you haven't been here with us in a while, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for being with us. Can we welcome all of our visitors today, all of our, our visitors watching online as well? We've got discipleship classes coming up in September. Angel wanted me to remind you that uh, we ask that you register for those just so that we can, we can make sure we have enough resources and, and space available for you. Um, so, so please go online, either to the website or, uh, or on the app, and register. Make sure you secure your spot for those classes, whether it's the discipleship class with Bill Jordan, which... Come on, that's going, to be, that's going to be some good stuff. Bill's teaching that class, or, uh, or Pastor Angel and I are teaching a class on, on marriage, and, uh, and hopefully we, we learn as much as you guys do in that class, because we've been married for 15 years, but we're still learning stuff, it feels like, every single day. And, uh, and so we'll just invite you guys, no matter where you're at, what season of life you're in, come on out, be a part of a discipleship class on Wednesday, but make sure that you get registered for that. Today we're going to continue our series we started last week entitled Refi. We're looking at refinance. And uh, and last week we said that if we're going to if we're going to refinance, which which we are are talking about coming back to cuz re means to to come back to or to do again. If we're going to come back to God's word in the area of our finance, last week we said that we have to understand and we have to develop a healthy relationship with money. As Americans, we have such a toxic an unhealthy relationship with money. Jesus, as we'll read here in a, in a few moments in Matthew chapter 6, says you can't serve both God and money. It's impossible to do both at the same time. And if, if all of us here today, if all of us watching online today say that, that our heart's desire really is to, to serve God with every aspect of our being, then we have to make sure that we are not trying to serve or we are not being enslaved by money at the same time, because it's impossible for us to do both. So we have to have a healthy relationship with money. Today, I want us to talk about tithing. Somebody say tithe. tithe. Talking about the tithe. What is the tithe? What does, what does it mean to tithe? Do we still have to tithe? And we'll, we'll get into all of that here in a little bit. But, but two verses I want us to, to look at to kind of launch us into our time today. Matthew chapter 6. We read it last week. We'll We'll read it again this week. We will probably read it again for the next coming weeks because really this is the heart behind this series. But Matthew chapter 6 and then Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Matthew 6, beginning in verse number 19. If you don't have your Bibles, the verses will be on the screens for you. Jesus is speaking and he says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Instead, store your treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. When your eye is like a lamp that provides light for the body, when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light that you think you have is actual darkness, how deep that darkness truly is. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and be enslaved to money. Malachi chapter 3, which if you don't know where Malachi is, the, just, just flip to the left a little bit. Uh, you'll find it, the last book of the Old Testament, chapter 3, beginning in verse, 10, or verse 8 through verse 10. Jesus, God is, is speaking through the prophet Malachi, and he's 
he's kind of sitting his kids down for one of those talks. Parents, have you ever had that conversation with your kids where it's like, listen, sit down because we need to talk. You're doing things that you ought not be doing. You're not doing things that you should be doing, and I'm fed up with it. Have you ever been fed up with your kids? Thank you, those parents that are honest enough to admit that. You ever wanted to just send your kids back to the manufacturer? Wish you kept the receipt on the... God's having that conversation to the the Israelites through the prophet Malachi. And here's what he says. Verse 8 says, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? And God says, you've cheated me of tithes and offerings that are due me. Listen to what he says. He says, you are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. Let's pray this morning and then let's get into God's word and, and, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to open our eyes, open our hearts and just to bring revelation to us today. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence that is in this place. God, we thank you that, that we, we have the freedom to gather together in your name, to, to, to worship together corporately, to exalt your name, to magnify your name, to glorify your name. That is why we are gathered here today, to encounter you, to be in your presence, to lift up your name. And so, Lord, as we do that, and today as we, as we examine your word, as we study your word, as we open your word together, I pray that, that you would open our eyes, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our ears, that we would see things that we haven't seen before, maybe hear things we hadn't heard before, and God, that you would give us revelation, fresh revelation. God, I pray that you would give us a word for today. Wherever we find ourselves, your word is living and it's active and it's breathing and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and it's applicable to each and every one of us, no matter where we are on our spiritual journey, no matter where we are on our financial journey, no matter where we are today, God, your word is applicable to our lives. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to take it, to apply it, that we might not just be hearers of your word, but doers as well. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. 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 This morning we're talking about the tithe, and it's, it's, one, of those, it's one of those subjects that um, can, can cause some division even within the church because the, the question always will come up, well, the tithe is an Old Testament command. It's an Old Testament principle. But, but Pastor John, I'm a New Testament believer, and that was the Old Covenant, and I'm not under the Old Covenant, but now I'm under the New Covenant, and we'll get into, we'll get into some of that. But, but it's one of those conversations, it's one of those topics, one of those discussions that, that can tend to be uh, a little bit divisive if, if we're not careful, if we don't come into it with the right motives. I think sometimes we look at, at preachers on TV and, and the impression that we get or the impression that they put off is that they're only talking about the tithe because of what they want to get from you. And so we can sometimes, if we've had a, an abusive spiritual leader, we can, we can transfer or translate what we interpret about a spiritual leader onto our Heavenly Father. And if my my spiritual leader is being abusive to me spiritually, and he's only after what, what I have so that he can have more, then we transfer that onto God. And so when God asks me to bring the tithe, well, God only wants that because of what he can get from me. And, and, and if we're not careful, we can, we can transfer a lot of those those ideas or those understandings of spiritually abusive leaders onto our Heavenly Father. So I think when we, when we come into it with, with incorrect motives or incorrect understanding or, or incorrect perspectives, it's easy for us to, to, to get on the defensive, to put up our walls and say, well, Pastor John, that's not for me. And if it is for me, then God will show it to me. And he has through his word, but, but nevertheless, God will show it to me. And, and, and one day, then maybe I'll, I'll be, be able to have this conversation, but not right now. I think, I think we, can, we, can, we can come into it with those understandings or those perspectives, and it just kind of sets the whole conversation off wrong. This morning, as we, we look at the tithe, yes, the tithe is a command that is given in the Old Testament. Yes, it's, it's a principle that is found in the Old Testament, but it's also a principle that Jesus 
commends in the New Testament. It's also something that Jesus uh, speaks about in the New Testament. He tells the Pharisees, you know, you tithe, and that's good, and you should. He goes on to tell them, you know, don't forget about these other things. You should still do those things, but let's not forget about mercy, and let's not forget about justice, and let's not forget about some of these other things that the law also states. And so Jesus talks about it in the New Testament as well. But every time we see the tithe in the Old Testament, the word that is associated with it is, is what, we are, what we are told to do is to bring the tithe. We are never told to give the tithe. You will see that as you study scripture, whether it's Abraham in the very beginning before the law, and he brings the tithe to the priest Melchizedek. If it's, if it's Jacob, who after the, the dream that God had given him, Jacob says, God, if you will go with me and if you will protect me and you will watch out for me, I will always bring a tithe unto you, not just this one time, but continuously. If you read it in the law, bring the tithe, Malachi chapter three, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Every time you see tithe, it's associated with something that you bring. It's never associated with something that you give. Now, why the distinction? Why the differentiation? Because you can't give something that isn't yours. I can't give you something that's not mine. I can bring it. I can bring it back. If you, if you rent a tool from Home Depot, let's say, let's say you know, the windstorm came through, didn't have a chainsaw, we go to Home Depot, we rent a chainsaw from Home Depot, we go, we, we clean up our, our backyard, we help our neighbor clean up their yard. And imagine if we returned to Home Depot and said, I would like to give you this chainsaw. <laughs> the lady at the counter would say, well, that's very nice of you, but it's ours to begin with. So thank you, we'll take it back. You can't give something, you can't give something that isn't yours. If you let me borrow your car and then I return it to you and I'm like, hey, I would like to, I, I just want to bless you with the car. <laughs> I've decided in my heart to give you this vehicle. Your response to me would be, what are you talking about? But I think a lot of times when we, when we think about the tithe, we can come to church and we can write out our check or we can get on the app or we can do whatever we do. And it's like, okay, God, I've decided in my heart to give this to you. Well, that's cute. But it was never yours to begin with. See, when you, when you study the tithe in the Old Testament, the tithe... They, the, the Israelites understood and they, they had this understanding that, that the tithe, they didn't even think about it. It wasn't even a concern to them because to them, it didn't belong to them. It's not mine. This is God's. It's something that I have to bring to him. Why? Because, because he's given it to me. It's his. I'm just entrusted with it. And so I bring it back to him. You can't give something that isn't yours. You can bring it but you can't give it. You can return it, but it's not a gift from you. There's a difference between tithes and offerings. Tithes are something that we bring back to God because it's his. Offerings are above and beyond the tithe, and those are gifts. Those are things that we give. Yes, we can give, but we can't give until we first bring. Until we bring the tithe, we're not giving. We're bringing. Now, what is tithe? What, is, what does that mean? Tithe simply means this, 10%. It means a tenth. That's the literal definition of the word tithe. A tithe is a tenth. It's the first tenth. It's that first 10%. It's the first fruit. It's what you do with that first part. As we look at God's word, as we look at the tithe, there's a couple of things that, that I want us to understand to walk away with today. And again, the first one is this, that, that we have to understand that tithing is a command. Tithing is 100% a command. We find it in the law, Leviticus 27, God's giving the, the, the law to Moses. And here's what, here's what he says. He says, one-tenth, there's the definition, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. Whose is it? 
It's God's. It's not ours. It wasn't theirs. It's not mine. It belongs to God and must be set apart to him as holy. When you set something apart for God, it is holy, it is, it, is, it is consecrated, it is separated for use by God and for his purpose. The tithe is the same way. The tithe is that first 10%. It's set apart, and when it's brought to God, God makes it holy. The question is, what are you doing with your tithe? Because you're all tithing to something. Who are you tithing to? Some of us tithe to God. Some of us bring God his tithe. And, and that first fruit, that first 10%, that first tenth goes to God. Some of us tithe to the mortgage company. Some of us tithe to the cable company. It's because the Wi-Fi is that important. Some of us, some of us tithe to, 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 to Starbucks. Some of us tithe to Chipotle. We can tithe to all of these other places, but the only one who can make the tithe holy is God. The only one who can redeem the tithe is God. Tithing is a command. Yes, it's a command found in the Old Testament. And for those of you right now that are are thinking it, because I can read your mind and it's like, well, Pastor John, that's Old Testament. I'm New Testament. That's Old Covenant. I'm not under that covenant anymore. Yes, Romans chapter seven, Paul says that we don't have to obey God by obeying the letter of the law anymore, but now we can obey God by living in the spirit, which frees us from, 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 from the ceremonial aspects of the law but it doesn't completely remove the morality of the law. See, we have to understand that the the law was was morals, do this, and it was ceremonial. Here's how you do it. There were morals in ceremony in the two tied together in observance of the morality of the law and in in practice ceremonially, the observation of the law would, would make me right with God. It would bring me into right standing with God. But through the blood of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made and my faith in him, I don't have to observe the ceremonial aspects of the law to make me right in God's eyes. I just have to live according to the spirit by faith in Jesus. Now I've been made right with God. So I don't need the ceremony of the law, but that also means that I don't have to just completely throw out the morality of the law either. I can't just do that. That law, those commands, those things are still there. Jesus himself said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to what? To fulfill the law. I came to fulfill the law's purpose, Matthew chapter 5. And I want us to, to look at that scripture, Matthew chapter 5. He says this, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writing of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. He continues in verse 18. He says, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. That's not me. I don't want that to be me. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So he, even here, Jesus is teaching and Jesus says, listen, I didn't come to, to, to remove the law. I didn't come to get rid of the law. The law was pointing you to me, whether you knew it or not. I came to fulfill the law, but the law in itself and the commands that it gives and the morality of it is well and is good and it should be continued to be, to be observed for morality's sake, not ceremony's sake. But if you fail to continue to do these things, you'll be the least in my kingdom. But those who observe the law and do everything written in it, you will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus himself teaches that, yes, the law is there. And yes, the law is good. And yes, the law should continue to be be observed, to continue to to be studied. And no, not ceremonially, but for morality. Jesus, again, he shows us this in practice when When the Sabbath is a command that's given in the law, ceremonially, the observance of the the command of Sabbath, they wouldn't work, they wouldn't do, they wouldn't do anything. And the Pharisees had gotten to the point where they were they were watching, their job was to watch people on the Sabbath. And if somebody did something, oh, you're breaking the law. Oh, did you see that? He mowed his grass. He's breaking the law. If you did anything on a on a Sabbath, they, they were watching. Jesus, one day, the, 
the Bible tells us that this man came and he had a withered hand and Jesus had the man stand up and the Pharisees were like, wait, wait, he's going to do it. They were trying to trap him. They were always trying to find something to accuse Jesus of. And here, if Jesus heals on the Sabbath, if he, if he works on the Sabbath or he performs on the Sabbath, is he then breaking the law? And Jesus stands up. He tells this man to stand up. And looking at the Pharisees, because he knew what was in their minds already, he said, tell me which is lawful to do on the Sabbath, to do evil or to do good? Pharisees are like, well, I don't really have an answer for that. Jesus is essentially asking, like, is it, is it wrong to do something good on the Sabbath? Is it wrong to do a good deed? And he tells the man, stretch out your hand, and the man's hand instantly is healed. From that moment on, the Pharisees were always plotting to kill Jesus. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. Why? Because the morality and the principle of the Sabbath and taking a day and observing it and recognizing God in everything and resting on that day as God rested even from the very beginning and morality is good. Ceremonially, you don't have to continue to practice it that way and you don't have to be careful to obey every letter of every law, but understand that the morality is still there and should continue to be observed. The commands of the Old Testament are not completely done away with. We just have to understand that the way that they were practiced then, we don't have to practice them the same way. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater at the same time. We can't completely remove that. So for those of you that are like, well, well, I'm under the new covenant. Okay. You know what Jesus did with the, the morality of the old covenant, of the, of the old law, the Mosaic law? He, he didn't. He didn't remove it. He added to it. He added to it, right? In, in, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you know, the law says, thou shalt not murder. But I say, anybody who has anger in their heart towards their brother is subject to judgment. See, the old law was if you murder, you'll be judged. But I tell you, if there's anything in your heart against somebody, you will be judged. He said, the old law says don't commit adultery. But I say, even if you look lustfully on a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Amen. The old law was this. Jesus says, I'm taking it a step further because now it's not just about what you do, but it's about what's going on in here. I think if, if, if Jesus were to speak specifically to the tithe, he would say, you know, the law says to bring a tenth. But I say, be ready, be, be ready to give everything away. Amen. And oftentimes he would ask people to do that. Yep. He would tell them, go sell everything. He would tell them, you know, let the, the dead bury their own dead. Come and follow me. Am, am I the most important thing in your heart and in your, in your life? Jesus was always adding to the, 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 the covet, to, to, the, to the law in he didn't negate it. He didn't get rid of it. He didn't throw it out. He said, no, there, there's, there's more. I'm, I'm adding to it. I'm adding on to it. So for those of you that are saying, well, I'm, I'm new covenant, my question to you is, is why do you claim that? Are you saying that to get out of doing something? Or are you saying that to free yourself up to do more? Because really, that's what the new, the, the new covenant does. The new covenant tells us that we're not under this, we're not under the law anymore, but now we've been freed up to live according to the spirit, which is even greater and takes us to a, to a whole nother level than the law ever could. The new covenant doesn't say, now we don't, now we get to just live however we want. Jesus paid the price. He's, 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 you know, his, his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins. He's redeemed us. We've been adopted into his family. Now we get to live however we want. No, Paul says, what do we say in response to this grace? Do we just keep on sinning? No, of course we don't. Of course not, because that's not the purpose, and that's not what the new covenant is, and that's not what life in the Spirit looks like. Life in the Spirit is not, now I don't have to, but life in the Spirit is, now I get to go further. So when we say we're not tithing because I'm not tied to the old covenant, are you just saying that to remove yourself from this? Or are you saying this so that now you can give more? Because tithing might not be an overt command in the New Testament, but do you know what is? Live generously. Generosity 
is an overt command in the New Testament. What does it mean to be generous? It means to be, to be liberal with. It means to give more than expected or needed. Are you giving more than expected? Are you giving more than what is needed? Are you, are you being generous? If you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm being generous. Okay, well, what do, you, what do you put that at? Does it need to be 10%? No, it needs to be generous. Does it need to be 12? It, it, be generous. Jesus sat his disciples down one day across from the treasury as people were bringing in their offerings into the temple. All these rich people brought in these, these bags full of money and dropped them off so that everybody could see, look how much I'm giving. Bob says that this one little widow came in and she dropped two copper coins that were worth just a couple cents, two pennies. She dropped two pennies in the offering plate, in the treasury at the temple. And Jesus stopped the show. He said, everybody, stop. Listen, do you see that woman? She gave more than all of them combined. Because they gave a percentage out of their abundance, but she gave everything that she had. Is that how you're giving? Is that, do, you, do you feel like you're giving in that way? Statistically, you know what the statistics are? Statistically, Christians are so generous that Christians give 2.6% of their income back to God. You want to talk about tithing. Tithing is the first 10%. You know how many, how many Christians tithe? The first 10%. 10%, God, I'm bringing this back to you. Not, I'm going to pay my bills. Not, I'm going to go out to dinner. Not, I'm going to pay for vacation. And then whatever's left, God, I'll bring you at the end of the month. But God, every time I get paid, God, every time there's increase, God, any time you bless me with anything, that first fruit, that first 10%, that goes to you. What percentage of Christians tithe today? 15%. A tithe of the Christians are tithing. And of all Christians, averaged together, we give about 2.6% of what God has, has blessed us and given us and entrusted us with, and we bring that back to him. 2.6%. Well, I'm not under the old covenant. No, but the new covenant says that you're supposed to be generous. Would you say that 2.6% is generous? Anybody say that 2.6% is generous? Online, do you think 2.6% is generous? No, it's, it, it's not. I would say no. I would say, I would say no, it's not. And so whether you want to be legalistic, and, and that's not what this is about. I'm, I'm giving 10%. I'm only giving 10%. Or if you want to be generous, no matter where we find ourselves in this conversation, we have to understand that, yes, the tithe is a command. Yes, it's there. No, Jesus didn't throw it out and Jesus didn't get rid of it. He didn't wash it away. It's still there. But even adding on to that, we are called to be, to be disciples and followers of Jesus, to bring him what is due to him, and then to be generous on top of that. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, I think that that's an area that regardless of where we are, and regardless of what our giving report at the end of the year looks like, we all can do better in. We all can do better in that. Imagine what we could do if, if we all just decided to tithe. Imagine what we could do if we, could, if we all just decided to be obedient to God in this area. If we were the statistical norm, and let's say that 2.5% of the people at Dream City Church actually were, were tithing, or excuse me, we were giving 2.6% of our income. If we bumped that up to 10%, you know what we could do? We could, we, we could build a dream center next month. We could, we could build a new church. We could go buy land tomorrow. We could build a new building in six months. If we went from where we are to where God has called us to be. Think about the people that we could reach in this city. Think about the, the, the lost and the hurting and the broken that need to experience the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. That could be found if we would just be obedient to do what God's word says to do. We have to understand that, that the, the tithe is a command. The second thing that we have to understand is that tithing grows our faith. Tithing grows our faith. Matthew chapter 6, look at what, what Jesus says. He says, don't worry. 
about these things. Don't, don't worry, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Are you unbelievers? No. So if these thoughts are, if these things are dominating your thoughts, something needs to change. Yeah. But your heavenly father already knows all of your needs. He goes on to say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things that you're worrying about, God is already going to give you if you choose to seek him and put him first. See, tithing grows our faith. Why? Because every time you get paid, you have a choice. You can either put your trust in God or put your trust in yourself. That's the choice that you're given. If I trust in God, then I will bring him that first fruit, that first 10%, and he will make the 90% last longer. He will bless me. He will cause me to increase. He will be watch out, watching out for me. He, he will be providing for me. He's got all of my needs. He knows all of that. He's, he's got me He's got me in his hands. If I tithe, I'm trusting in him. If I don't, it's, it's like, okay, well, what am I going to eat? And God, if I give you this 10%, what am I going to drink? And what am I going to wear? And what are my kids going to wear to school? And, and I've got school supplies this month and, and all of these things that are going on. And I've got new tires on the van that I got to put this, this winter. And I've got, got all of these things. And God, if I bring you that 10%, how will I be able to do all of this? Are you trusting in God or are you trusting in yourself? Are you trusting in God or are you trusting in, in what you can produce? And what happens, and listen, I, I promise you, I'm not just saying this. I could call people up here and we could, we could have an te old school testimony service. Anybody ever remember testimony services? We could have an old school testimony service for the next three hours about things that God has done in and, and, and ways that he's provided unexpectedly as we've put him first in this area. I've told the story before, I'll tell it again. I, I worked construction and, and we were going through a hard time and it was storming. It was a, a stormy summer and so it was like three weeks in a row we couldn't get on a roof and we weren't working. And if we're not working, boss ain't getting paid. And if boss isn't getting paid, we're not getting paid. And, and we had two little kids at home and we weren't working and our bank account is going down. We have nothing, literally nothing. Angel's working part-time and we get paid and she says, well, we have to tithe. And I said, do we? Listen, pastor's kid grew up in church. We have to tithe. Do we? Do we really though? Because if we do, we can't buy cereal. If we do, there's no ramen noodles. If we do, like, it was, it was at that point. She says, no, absolutely we do. She says, God's got us. Yeah. Wrote out that tithe check and it literally hurt me. Like, how are, how are we going to do this? And I went to work, went to work the next week and came home. And as I was leaving work that day, one of the guys that I was working with, he, he followed me out to my truck and he said, John, I feel like God wants me to give this to you. And it was a $100 Walmart gift card. He said, I feel like, like God told me to do this. And God told me, and in my pride, I'm like, no, like, put your money away. I don't need your money. I don't need charity. I'm a man. I'm providing for my, like, I've, I've got it. Don't worry. He says, no, I feel, like you, I feel like God told me to do this. And if I don't do it, then I'm being disobedient. I'm like, whatever, give it to me. <laughs> so I went home and I walked in the door and I said, Angel, you'll never believe what happened. And she just started crying. I said, that's nice, but like, <laughs> why are we crying? And she said, today I was praying and I just prayed. And I said, God, if I, if I just had $100 to go grocery shopping with. I came home with this gift card from a friend of mine who didn't know, but God knew. He didn't see us, but God saw us. When we, when we decide to put God first in this area, it grows our faith. Bringing God that first fruit grows our faith because as we trust in him and as we seek him first, you know what he does? Every single time he responds. Every single time he answers the call. Right. You know, the, the, the only area that God has ever told anybody to test him in is the tithe. Yeah. The only time God ever says, try it. Yeah. 30 days, money back guarantee. <laughs> try it. If you don't like it, we'll send you an envelope. You can ship it back. Try, just try it. Yeah. 
The only time he ever says that is with the tithe. He says, try it. Try me. See if I, see if I won't do what I say I'm going to do. See, we have to understand that the tithe is a command. Secondly, the tithe grows our faith. The third thing that tithing does is it teaches us to prioritize. It teaches us to prioritize. Proverbs tells us to honor the Lord with the, the first share of all of our crops. Tithing is about putting God first. And let me tell you, if you can put God first in this area, you can put God first in any area. Seriously. When it, comes to, when it comes to your resources, when it comes to your money, when it comes to when you get paid, if you can put God first in the area of your finances, when it comes to your marriage, it's easy to put God first. When it comes to your kids, it's easy to put God first. When it comes to your week or your day or, or what do we do, over, it's easy to put God first in those areas. Why? Because there's something about our money and something about our, our resources, the fruit of our labor, that if we can put God first in this area, typically what happens is everything else kind of starts to fall in line. When people come and they're like, Pastor John, my finances are a mess and and I need some financial counseling. I need financial help. My first question, are you tithing? Well, no. Okay, well, there's the problem. If you're not putting God first, nothing else can be ordered correctly. But once you begin to put God first in this area, then you'll put him first over here. Then you'll prioritize this. And until God is first in your finances, he's not first in your life. That's the truth of the matter. Like we can say that God is first. And and one of the values here at Dream City is we want to put God first in every area. But until God is first in the area of my finances, I cannot stand up and say that God is first in my life. He might be second. He might be third. But he's not first. Until he has all of me, he has none of me. Until I'm willing to give him everything, have I given him anything? That's the life that we're called to live. And we have to put him first. And tithing teaches us to do that. Try it. See what happens. 90 days. Give it a shot. What do you got to lose? A couple trips to Starbucks. Okay, you didn't eat Starbucks anyway. Brew your own coffee. It's better. (laughs) What are you going to lose? Chipotle. Okay, make some tacos at home. It's fine. Don't go out to eat every day. Pack a lunch. Do what you have to do. Put God first in this area. Order your life around God first and watch how God ordains and orders your steps after that. Seek him first. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. Seek first his word. Be careful to obey everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. We want prosper and we want success, but we don't want to follow the commands of God's word. We have to understand tithing is, is the command. Why do I tithe? I tithe because tithing grows my faith. Why, why should I tithe? I tithe because tithing teaches me to, to prioritize and put God first in every area. And then the last thing that I want you to understand is that the tithing isn't about invoking God's blessings, but recognizing God's blessings. See, I think a lot of times when we quote Malachi chapter 3, and we read it at the beginning this morning, says, you're robbing me. How are we robbing you? You're robbing me in the tithes and offerings that are due me. He goes on to say, to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be enough food in my house. Then I will, what does God say? I will open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing that you will not be able to contain. And a lot of times we quote that verse and we focus on verse 10, right? Like like God is going to, to bless you in ways that you won't understand. And he will. And there's nothing wrong with us quoting that verse. And there's nothing wrong with us standing on the promises of God. And that is a promise that he has given us. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can, we can start to to tithe or we can start to be generous or we can start to do some of these things as a way to twist God's arm. Like, okay. God, 10%, right? There's my 10%. Now what are you going to do? Because God, you said, God will and God does. But here's the thing. The reason we tithe is not because of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. The reason we tithe is not because he's going to pour out blessings that we can't contain. The reason we tithe is John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. The reason we tithe is not to get, but the reason we tithe is because we've already received. It's not to get more of God's blessings, but it's a recognition of the blessings that God has already given us. The very first tithe in Scripture, those of you that are, that are tithes connected to the law people, the very first tithe in Scripture is pre-law. It goes back before the law was even a thing. Genesis chapter 14. Abraham goes and he, he encounters four kings and he goes into battle. He wins this battle. He rescues his nephew Lot. He, he, he regains all of the possessions that were stolen to him. And Melchizedek, who is the king in Jerusalem, he was a, a priest of God. He comes to him and he, he comes to Abraham. He brings out bread, wine. He was the priest at the time. He gave a blessing to Abraham. Here's what he said. May the most high God bless Abraham. May the creator of heaven and earth bless him. Let's continue. Give praise to the Most High God because he gave. Who did it? God did it. God gave your enemies into your hand. So listen, Melchizedek comes and he says, listen, God's going to bless you and God's going to strengthen you and God's going to be with you. But look at what God's already done. He gave you victory in this battle. He brought everything back to you. The victory you walk in today is not your victory, but it's God's victory. What is Abraham's response? Abraham brings a tithe. Abraham brings the tithe, not of the future blessing, but Abraham brings the tithe in recognition of the blessing he's walking in today. When we tithe, it's not, okay, God, you're going to bless me tomorrow, and we look forward to the future, and we, we're looking into that. No, we bring the tithe because everything that we have is a blessing from him. Yeah. Yes. So it's not invoking tomorrow's blessing, but it's recognizing today's blessing. God established the tithe and he told them, you're going into a land that is going to be fruitful for you. It's going to produce, it's going to produce incredible fruit. But when you get there, understand who got you there. You didn't get yourself there. I got you there. And because I got you there, when this land produces fruit for you and your crops begin to grow, bring a tenth of it back to me. Why? Because you'll remember the blessings that you're walking in then. And if you do that, I'll continue to bless you. Amen. And when I bless you tomorrow, in light of those blessings, return to me what is due me. And I'll bless you the next day. And in recognition of those blessings, return to me what is mine. And I'll bless you the next day. But he doesn't say, bring me the tithe and look for next year's crop. Bring me the, bring me the tithe in response to what I'm going. No, bring me the tithe in response to what I've done. And if you order your life around this, I'll continue to bless you. Luis, you can come back to the piano today. But this morning, as we, we talk about refi and, and refinancing, it's very important for us to understand the command of the tithe. Because a lot of us, we, whether, we, whether we didn't grow up in church or we grew up in in a church that taught something different. Some of us didn't grow up understanding that the tithe was something that was commanded of us by God. And that, that, command, still, that command still remains. Just as the command of thou shalt not murder still remains, just the, the command of honor the, the Sabbath and keep it holy, don't take my name in vain. Those commands, the morality of the commands. No, we don't observe them in the same way, but the morality in those commands, those continue, those remain. Amen. So the command still stands, stands for you and I today to, to put God first in this area, to bring him the first fruit, to bring him that first tenth, to set it apart as holy unto God, to be used by him and for him. It's a command for us that we need to, to understand. If we're going to have a proper relationship with money, no, money can't master us. And if money is mastering us, there's no way we're tithing. If we're tithing, then money can't master us. But if we're enslaved to money, you know what we do with our money? That's how we live. But if we become the boss of our money, you know what we do? God, this is yours. What do you want me to do with this? 
God, thank you for letting me keep this. We begin to, to order things in a whole different way. And as we order things in a different way, we live our lives in a different way. And as we live our lives in a different way, the fruits that our lives produces is completely different. Before we're living life like this, wondering what are we gonna eat? What are we gonna drink? What are we gonna wear? How am I gonna provide? How am I gonna fix? How am I gonna do? We start tithing, we start mastering our money. We have a healthy relationship with money. You know what we have? We have peace. We have contentment. We have joy. And we don't have to worry what tomorrow will bring because I know who holds tomorrow in his hands. And if he holds tomorrow in his hands, he's got me in his hands and he sees every need that I have and he's already promised to meet each and every one of them. And if it's just that I have food to eat and clothes to wear, I'll rejoice in that. If he takes away from me my truck, that's fine. If he takes away from me my house, that's fine. If he asks me to give it all tomorrow, that's fine. As long as I have food to eat, clothes to wear, as long as my kids are healthy, as long as I can still walk in the blessings of today, I will always thank him for that tomorrow. I will continue to put him first in this area. Why? Because he's shown himself faithful. He's shown him that, that, that I can trust in him. That if I do it, I might not have all the answers, but he does. The tithe is given in faith. The, the tithe increases our faith. The, the tithe is that first fruit, that first offering. And it says, God, whether you do or you don't, it doesn't matter because you've already done. This morning, I don't know where you're at on your, on your journey. You know where you're at, your spiritual journey, your, your financial journey. But what I do know is regardless of where we find ourselves today, there's always another step to take. There's always more. There's, God's always calling us into something something more, something that's stretching us, something that's growing us. Maybe, maybe you're here today, you say, Pastor John, I am tithing but I'm not giving. I am bringing, but I'm not giving. Maybe, maybe God's challenge to you is, you know what? Let's go from, from just being obedient to being generous. Let's go from 10% to 12% or 12% to 15%. Maybe you're here today and you, you're not giving anything. Maybe your next step is, you know what? This week, I'm gonna give 2%. And then next month, I'm gonna give 5%. And then the next month, I'm gonna give 7.5%. By the end of the year, I wanna be obedient in this area. I'm gonna give 10%. Some of you could do that right now if you just cut out fast food. I don't know what your next step is today, but I know each and every one of us has one. Holy Spirit's calling each and every one of us into a next step. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal savior, maybe your next step is just that. You need to prioritize your life. And before you can prioritize your money, you have to put Jesus as the Lord as, as the, the, the head of your life, the, the leader of your life, the master of your life. And if you haven't done that, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that today. So if you would just stand with me, those of you that are here in person, if you're watching online and you need to, to ask Jesus to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior, I'm gonna lead us in a, a quick prayer. Just ask if that's you, would you just pray this prayer, pray it from your heart, pray it out loud, mean every word of it. Just a prayer of confession, of recognition and acceptance of Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus, pray it out loud. Jesus, thank you so much that you gave up your life so that I could find new life in you. And today I admit I need a savior. I've done things and said things. I've messed up too many times to count. Would you forgive me? Would you wash me? Would you cleanse me? Would you make me brand new? Help me to live for you, not just today, but every day for the rest of my life. May I build my life around you, that you would be the Lord, the master of my life in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you today. God, I thank you for those that prayed that prayer. Lord, whether it's the first time, the 10th time, 100th time, it doesn't matter. There are angels rejoicing and celebrating in heaven right now because of the decision that they make. We thank you and we rejoice in that, God. For the rest of us who are here, Lord, we, we hear your word. We've been challenged by your word. Now the choice that we have is what are we gonna do with your word? 
Pray that you would help us to go, that we would meditate on it. Holy Spirit, would you continue to to speak and and the the seed that you planted, may it it take root deep within our heart. And whatever that next step is that you're challenging us to and you're calling us into, I pray that we would trust you to take that step, that we would trust you enough that our faith would be expanded. And as our faith is expanded and you show up, God, our faith would expand even more at that point because we know that you can be trusted. If we can trust you with this, then we can trust you with more tomorrow. And God, each and every day you show yourself faithful and trustworthy. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises associated with your word that we can stand and build our lives upon. And God, as we return to you your tithe and as we bring you your offering, God, may we not do it as a way to invoke blessing, but may we do it as a recognition of the blessings that you've already given us. We love you and we thank you this morning in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 Hey, listen, before you're dismissed, those of you that prayed that prayer, some of our prayer team is down here. We'd love to be able to pray with you, minister, answer any questions that you might have, or or if you're out there and you're going through something, you need somebody to pray with you, to, to lock arms with you and agree with you on, that's what our prayer team is down here for. We'd love to be able to minister to you in that way. If not, be blessed, church. Love you guys. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. Here at Dream City Omaha, we're all about three things, helping people discover Christ, recover identity, or uncover purpose. If you enjoyed today's service, we encourage you to check out our past sermon series as well as our discipleship classes. Give us a subscribe and we hope that we can help you grow no matter where you are.